Well, here we are again, and welcome as we are going to study the readings for this coming Sunday. It's the second Sunday of Easter, so they consider Easter itself as the first Sunday of Easter. This is now going to be the second Sunday of Easter. We're going to study the readings in chronological order with the gospel reading from John's gospel, then the first reading from the book of Acts, and then conclude with the second reading from John's first letter. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that this is our time to get together and to hear your word. So as we do that, as we gather, we are all expectant to hear something that you're going to teach us, to hear what you want us to hear, to know what you want us to know. So we ask you to open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive your word. We thank you, Lord, that as we study these things, that they are so important to us and they will help us throughout our lives as we walk day to day and seek to walk closer to you. We receive the lessons and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Bible timeline, since all the readings, again, are from the New Testament, we'll zoom into this small section on the right of the timeline. And the event of John's gospel takes place in 29 AD. First reading from the book of Acts is also in 29 AD. And the first letter by John, to the, in, it's in the New Testament, was written in 90 AD. The chronology of events in the gospel readings after the reading about the resurrection of Jesus last week are going to take us for the next several weeks up to his ascension into heaven. The gospel reading from chapter 20 of John's gospel, the first 18 verses of chapter 20 are John's account of the resurrection of Jesus, and it covers the discovery of the empty tomb by Peter and John, as well as the meeting by Mary Magdalene, with whom she first thought was the gardener, but then is revealed to her as the risen Christ. Then the chapter continues with our reading. Chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So first of all, this reference to the first day of the week. This is the day after the Sabbath. The Sabbath was Saturday on our calendars. And it will eventually become the day of the week, Sunday, the first day of the week, on which Christians will gather to fellowship and worship in recognition of the day of the week that Jesus was resurrected. So this is the day after the resurrection. The doors are shut and locked. Still afraid that uh, this, this is the day of the resurrection. I'm sorry. It's first day of the week. It's Sunday. Doors are shut and locked. They're still afraid that the Jewish authorities are coming after them because they knew that they, as followers of Jesus, they were looking to still round up his followers. So now Jesus materializes before them. Um, here again, one of the scientific things I like to think about says there's uh, so much space between the atoms of our body that if all the space were removed and the solid matter was compacted, it would be the size of a postage stamp. In fact, if you ever, if you've watched the uh, uh, movie that's out now, um, Oppenheimer, in that movie, he actually, someone asks him what physics is, and uh, he explains that very thing. He says that the atoms are, have so much space in between them that if you compact them, it'd be a very, very small amount of, of material. So, that's what science is saying, that if you compacted our bodies, it'd be the size of a postage stamp. And so if this, and this is also true of anything that we consider solid. So the atoms of the wall had the same, a lot of space between the atoms of the wall. So what perhaps Jesus was able to do with his glorified body was to rearrange the atoms in his body because when they touched him, he felt solid. But rearrange the atoms in his body so that he could pass in between the in those spaces in the wall. Maybe that's what happened. We don't know, but that's 
another speculation that, that I like to think about. Someday we're going to actually know how this is all accomplished. Uh, in his appearance before his disciples, Jesus here makes sure that he shows the nail marks on his body as identifying proof that he is who he is, leaving no doubt with them that it is Jesus. The peace that he pronounces here is the same peace that he gave in the upper room at the Last Supper, if you remember. What is that peace? It's the inner peace that is theirs, and it's ours. It's our inheritance. We can appropriate that peace. All we have to do is ask for it, and he will give us that peace. Now the reading continues. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. And whose sins you retain are retained. So here, when Jesus breathes on the disciples, it's very much like the creation. In the book of Genesis, it says, God breathed into the nostrils of Adam to make him the first human. He gave Adam eternal life. The Holy Spirit came into him. But by sinning, Adam lost the eternal life that he had and, and that Jesus was not then sent to the earth to restore. So here, as believers in him, Jesus is restoring eternal life to humanity that was lost in the garden. This breathing on the disciples is also imparting the Holy Spirit to them in a way that brings them new wisdom and understanding. It's specifically the ability to observe a person. And that's why he says, whose sins you've forgiven, they're forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. Because it gives them now the ability to observe a person and based on their contriteness, based upon those who are actually repentant, to be able to determine whether a person is specifically contrite to the point that their sins are forgiven. The disciples will not forgive their sins. It's not the disciples who will forgive them. Only God can do that. I mean, even our Catholic Catechism says that. But what it says here is the ability is given here to be able to observe people and discern that they refuse to believe or they pretend to believe, but their life shows no sign of change. Therefore, that person can be told that their sins have not yet been forgiven because they're still wrestling with guilt, perhaps, since they do not truly believe or they have not truly made Jesus their Lord and Savior. So there are a number of reasons how through this discernment, the disciples can look at a person, determine if they can at least pronounce to them whether they believe, based upon the discernment they have through the Holy Spirit, that that person's sins are forgiven. Not by them, but by God himself. In any case, we have uh, last week's first reading. We saw in Acts 10.43, Peter was in the house of the Roman centurion Cornelius, and he says about Jesus at that place, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We keep seeing that over and over again. It's through his name. That's how important his name is. And now later in the book of Acts, they are again filled with the Spirit and are given a more powerful and convincing witness to what they knew, understood, and what they experienced. So it becomes at Pentecost where they will receive, through the Holy Spirit, the ability to preach and spread the good news, not just with their own language, but in other languages, and proceed from there to spread the good news with power, because that's what uh, Jesus will send with power. So now continuing with the reading, Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, this is interesting uh, comment. We call him Doubting Thomas over the centuries, but he actually should be called Honest Thomas because he's saying what he believes. He's not covering up the fact that He's not quite sure. I mean, they all were doubting before whether Jesus was even resurrected until they saw him with his presence in front of them. Now Thomas is where they were before they experienced seeing Jesus. So uh, 
He says what he believes. He wants to see the evidence for himself. So now the reading continues. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. So Jesus appears just like he did earlier. The door is shut. He appears before them. Now that Thomas is with them, we see that Jesus doesn't reprimand him. No, he invites him to see the evidence. By putting his hands in Jesus' scars, at this point, Thomas has this lifelong experience that he can make reference to when he is evangelizing that they must believe without seeing when he evangelizes. He can tell people, I doubted until I saw it, but I saw it. I put my hand in his, in the, in his side and in his hands, and uh, I believe, blessed are you that I am preaching to because you are believing without having the seeing. Now here, he exclaims, my Lord and my God. It's the first person to acknowledge that Jesus is not only Lord, but God too. Then Jesus adds that we who believe in him without seeing his body are blessed. So we're all blessed because we believe even though we have not seen. Now we're going to have other gospel readings from John's gospel in the weeks ahead, ahead but while it's Next verses are not in the reading Sunday. John concludes his, his uh, chapter with, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. So we have here that, John saying that his testimony is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. John records his testimony and invites us, those who read it, to believe in Jesus through his name and receive eternal life. The first reading Sunday is from the book of Acts, chapter 4. And it proceeds like this, at verse 32. The community of believers was of one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they had everything in common. With great power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great favor was accorded them all. There was no needy person among them, for those who owned property or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sale, and put them at the feet of the apostles, and they were distributed to each according to need. That's a very interesting passage here uh, because it tends to confuse some people. It tends to make others um, really have difficulty what, what this is saying. But verse 32, the community of believers was, a, was of one heart and mind. This is the heart and the soul of the true church, that anyone who has possessions they were not, no one claimed that they were their zone, but they had everything in common. Now, this is not communism. So I'm going to get into that in a little bit to, to explain the difference between Christianity and communism. This is living up to the covenant in which God says, what is mine is yours and what is ours is his. Everything belongs to God every, anyway. So then we say to one another, what is ours is yours. Your burdens are mine, my burdens are yours. We share everything in common, not just possessions, but also what we have as far as uh, feelings and burdens and things that we need to deal with. So, uh, and, and how else do we know what others' burdens are unless we get together and get to know one another without pretense or facade and that we share with one another? So that's what the saying here, the, ne the need to share. So, this is when we put God first, people second, and material things third, according to this passage. 
Now, Acts 2.42 refers to the continual breaking of bread, the Eucharist, with one another. So as the New Testament of my blood that Jesus said in Luke 22.20, 20, Jesus establishes for all time the implementation of the new covenant. Then verse 33 here says, With great power the apostles bore witness of the resurrection, and a great favor was accorded them all. What that's saying is, as the body was one together, so the power was manifested in spectacular ways as the grace of God. The grace, that word grace here is from the Greek word charis. It means that, a pouring, that outpouring from God, which results in joy, delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness. The grace of God fell upon them. Then in verse 34, no needy person among them or those who own property or houses. Now, it's important that they plural is here of houses. It didn't say they sold the house that they lived in if that was the only one they had. What it said, if they had houses, they would sell them. There are people today that have multiple houses all over the place. And that that's fine. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But this is saying that if they had extra houses, they sold them to help with those who had a need. And as it says in verse 35, put them at the feet of the apostles. They were distributed to each according to need. So they had to be able to discover what the needs were and distribute them accordingly. So this is the first century church, recognizing that one home was sufficient, that possessions beyond their need was wasteful. They found out that God is extravagant, but he's not wasteful. The church, as at verse 35 says, distributing to each according to their need. The church did this back then. The church should be doing this today. We shouldn't have government agencies having to offer welfare to people. If what was done in the first century church were done today, welfare from the government would not be a necessity. So the question is, why aren't the good churches doing this? Well, it turns out throughout the evolution of the church, there are two areas, two very important areas, where the Bible has not been followed as it should have been over the centuries. The first one is regarding society's perspective regarding race. And the second one, a non-compassionate use of accumulated wealth. So to address the first issue, last week we had in the first reading from Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches to the Gentiles about the need to treat everyone the same, that God shows no partiality regardless of nationality or race. As America became what has been called a melting pot, where people of all nations have been integrated into our society, the general acceptance of all nationalities has been fairly well adopted. We've had occasional exceptions throughout our history, but fairly well adopted. However, it was the American founding fathers who were faced with the issue of slavery, accepting the fiction that black people were not people but could be treated as a thing. Certainly there were advocates of the abolition of slavery, but the authors of the Constitution here, in order to create a unified set of states independent of English rule, thought that it was necessary to find a means of retaining slavery. That would then, as we know over time, lead to the Civil War, actually. We still suffer from vestiges of that kind of thinking by a significant percentage of America today. In fact, some Christian denominations, particularly in the southern states, adopted the belief that black people were inferior to white people and even took verses of scripture out of context to support that belief. The churches have failed to effectively communicate Peter's teaching that God shows no partiality. Let me say that again, that churches have failed to effectively communicate Peter's teaching. I see that God shows no partiality. Now, the other issue, that of non-compassionate use of accumulated wealth, particularly finds its proliferation as an outcome of the Industrial Revolution, started some 300 years ago. Now, the Bible doesn't say that accumulating wealth is evil, however. In fact, there are scriptures to support it. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, 
Remember then the Lord, your God, for he is the one who gives you the power to get wealth by fulfilling, as he has now done, the covenant he swore to your ancestors. There are many scriptures that command us to support the needy, the widows, the foreigners. For 300 years, the Industrial Revolution was the catalyst that enabled wealth to be accumulated at an accelerated rate. So what it's led to is a gross imbalance between the, the different populations of the United States in American society, where 1% of Americans control 29% of the nation's wealth, while 50% of Americans only control 6% of our wealth. Putting this another way, the three wealthiest people in the United States own more wealth than half the country. These three most wealthy people in the United States control $541 billion. So there's no question that the Industrial Revolution has done many good things for society. I'm not saying that's the, been the case. A lot of good things as a result of the Industrial uh, Revolution. However, just as the church has failed to teach effectively about race relations, the church has also failed in teaching the Old and New Testament emphasis on a compassionate use of wealth. Be starkly uh, represented by the fact that the average wealth of black families, average total wealth is $16,000. The average wealth of white families in America is $163,000. So the average white family has 10 times more wealth as black families. So this is a continued residual of the, uh, the lack of churches to be able to teach effectively. When it comes to preaching the scriptural principles of treating everyone equally and sharing wealth with those in need, throughout the centuries, the church has largely been silent. As a result, churches do what they can to support those in need, but even with government programs, there are still too many who fail to have adequate food and shelter. Now, another thing I want to uh, make you aware of is that we need to continually be on guard against being wrongly influenced by the entertainment industry that we know has a great influence on what society thinks. There's uh, movie and TV scripts that we know are written by people and they have, whoever writes these scripts have certain beliefs and value systems that may not necessarily coincide with scriptural beliefs and values. So I'm gonna show you an example here. Here's Larry David. So this is the, the gospel according to Larry David, if you want to say. Larry David is not God. He is actually the creator of the sitcom Seinfeld. But uh, as an actor in this movie, he says, communism and Christianity share the same false beliefs that people are fundamentally good. Well, on, on the face of it, it sounds like a reasonable comment as both communism and Christianity believe in sharing among society reflecting perhaps the fundamental goodness of humanity. But this is not scripturally true. We've studied this, in fact, in the past, as both the Old Testament and the New Testament say that man is not fundamentally good. Genesis 8.21 says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And we have in Matthew 19, 16, Mark 10, 17, and Luke 1, 19, all three of the synoptic gospels where Jesus says, there is none good but one, that is God. So as believers in scripture, Christians should understand that due to original sin through Adam, people are not fundamentally good. What is the major difference between Christianity and communism is that Christianity requires us to be born again. Communism does not. We know that communism is not based on the commandment to love one another. Communism is a forced collection and distribution, whether one likes it or not. We understand that as we watch the evolution of the Soviet Union and now Russia as the collective uh, collection and distribution and as it turns out, it's not distribution to everybody. It's the rich retaining their wealth at the expense of the poor in many cases. The distinction here is that rather than being forced collection, what Christianity is about 
is that there's no mandate to give your possessions for redistribution. The reading does not say they had to do it. It says that that's what they did because they believed in common. What you have is yours to do as you choose. And this is made clear in the book of the Acts in the story of a husband and wife. Uh, and they had this property and they sold it. And they decided they were going to keep some of the proceeds instead of it being redistributed. So Peter, te P Peter tells them it was theirs to do with as they wished, that nobody was going to take it away from them. Only a heart which is centered on our Savior Jesus Christ can a person out of that goodness, which is provided only by the Lord and the promise that he will supply all our needs, only that goodness can we share with what we have out of that goodness. So I hope that helps understand, helps you understand some things there that may be misunderstood relative to what the first century church did. Uh, what I think is important is to realize that the church has failed to teach what they needed to teach um, both those things about race and about uh, the accumulation of wealth. Now, the second reading is from the first letter of John. There's going to be several second readings from this first letter in the coming weeks. So what I'm going to do is look a little bit at the background of this writing of John's. That, uh, and this is the first one recorded of his that's in the New Testament. Referring to the New Testament timeline, you can see that all the Gospels, letters, and Book of Acts were written before 70 A.D., except for John's gospel, his three letters, and book of Revelation. Evidence indicates that John lived in Ephesus during most of his later years, beginning around 70 AD, that he was part of the dispersion of the Christians and the Jews from Jerusalem after the temple was destroyed. John wrote his gospel between 85 and 89 AD, and his letters after that between 89 and 90. So there's where his letters were written. First John, second John, and third John. And the one we're going to be looking at is his first letter to John. That's first, the first letter of John. And um, after uh, uh, being, uh, after writing his gospel, he was, as most Christians were, they were persecuted for their faith. So John spent 18 months in prison on the island of Patmos between 95 and 96 AD. And it's where he wrote the book of Revelation. After being released from prison, possibly due to old age, John returned to Ephesus and died sometime after 98 AD. So it's generally thought that John was the last surviving apostle. On the map of the Roman Empire, we see Jerusalem on the east where Jesus ministered and Christianity begins. Rome in the West, where Peter writes his letters and Paul writes several of his letters, and Ephesus in the middle, where John spends his final 30 years interrupted by his imprisonment on the island of Patmos, just off the coast of what is today Turkey. Because he doesn't address his letters to any specifically named individual, suggests that they were general letters that were copied and circulated throughout the church. So what I want to show here is an interesting comparison of the evolution of the Roman Empire versus the evolution of Christianity. Here's a chart, and I'm asking you, asking you to, I'm not asking you to assimilate all this. What it shows are the names of the major emperors of Rome. It says timeline of Roman emperors. And you can see on the left here, it starts out with Augustus and 29 BC. So he was the first Roman emperor, and it goes all the way through to the end where we have uh, the Western Empire and the Roman Empire ends. And so what we have in relation to this, so for 400 and uh, by 476 AD, the Roman Empire is concluded. In comparison to this timeline, Here's the time period at the bottom here that Jesus was on the earth, 4 BC to 30 AD. Then we have Christianity being started, and the events in the book of Acts then take up this amount of time, up to about 
uh, 65 AD. And then uh, John writes his book of Revelation, and the very last book of the Bible is written just before 100 AD. So we have then that the fact that there will be uh, that Christianity had evolved for 60 years before John wrote the book of Revelation. And Christianity saw a great persecution by the Roman Empire. But the Christianity outlived uh, 10 Roman empires uh, over the first 60 years of its existence. And there will be 43 more Roman emperors before Constantine decriminalizes Christianity. As you can see on the time that I've got there in the Black Arrow, Christianity is decriminalized not until 313 AD. And then we have by uh, persecutions by the Roman Empire cease as a result of the uh, decriminalization of Christianity. And then Christianity is declared the official state religion in 380 AD. So that comes sometime later, as you can see. So you have all of these Roman Empire emperors going through a time and it took almost 400 years after Jesus was born, but then they declare the Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire. Well, by 476 AD, the Roman Empire would no longer exist, while Christianity thrives and grows around the world even to this day. The average tenure of a Roman Empire was less than six years, while Jesus has reigned for all of eternity and Christianity continues and will continue until Jesus returns. Now, Peter and John addresses address different aspects. So we have seen some readings from Peter's letters. We're going to see the reading from John's first letter. They address different aspects of Christianity in their letters. What their ministries deal with can be related to what they were doing when Jesus called them to follow him. When Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, he calls fishermen to follow him, as described in Matthew 4, chapter 4. Jesus finds Peter, he's the one on the left, picture on the left, casting his nets. Peter is the apostle of hope, always casting to add new Christians, hopeful of their increase, and focusing on the kingdom of God. John, depicted on the right, he was mending the nets. He is the apostle of love that powerful force which mends people's hearts, and he focuses on the family of God. So we have the second reading. Sunday is from the first letter of John, chapter 5, starts at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is begotten by God, and everyone who loves the Father loves also the one begotten by him. In this way, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whoever is begotten by God conquers the world. And the victory that conquers the world is our faith. Who indeed is the victor over the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came through water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water alone, but by water and blood. The Spirit is the one that testifies, and the Spirit is truth. So here we have a key understanding in John's letter to convey the importance of fellowshipping with God's family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this section of this letter, John finishes with how we should be able to walk with confidence and assurance in our relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's what bridges our thinking from, I hope this works, to having the confidence to absolutely know, instead of hoping that God and his power is with us, knowing that his power is with us. So John starts out by explaining further the commandment of loving others, even though sometimes they may seem to be unlovely. Well, they may think from time to time that you're unlovely too. So don't think anyone else, someone else is the problem. Some people like to think everybody else is the problem and it's not them. Well, they may be considered to be unlovely by others as well. Anyway, he explains in verse one, 
everyone who believes that Jesus is, uh, is the Christ is begotten by God. Everyone who loves the Father loves also the one begotten by him. So who our brothers and sisters are is everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ because they're begotten by God. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, Christ here is the Greek word for the anointed one which means believing that he is the anointed one who God sent and through the cross gives people the opportunity to have their sins forgiven and have right standing with God, which is righteousness. That also means anyone in any denominational church or non-denominational church or independent church or community prayer group or whatever you want to call them, they represent your brothers and sisters. It defines for us the fact that as long as they believe this, they are born of God and are also children of God. So that was in verse 1. In verse 2, in this way we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments, that as children of God, we are to love one another because we are members of his family. And then he adds that if we truly love God, we need to obey the commandments in verse 2 and 3, it says that. This doesn't mean that we are to only love other Christians. That is where our love starts. But as God's love is for all the world, so must our love reach out to all the world. And as John says here in verse 4, the victory that conquers the world is our faith. Nuclear weapons will not conquer the world, but something more important than that does, and that is love. Then verse 5, who indeed is the victor over the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It brings us full circle to the understanding that in order for our love through faith to conquer the world, we first had to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then where he talks in verse 6 about he came through water and blood. So what he's referring to is that in the beginning and end of Jesus' ministry, that's what he faced water and blood. His ministry started with being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. So Matthew chapter 3 tells us about that event. When the John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, John gets the revelation through the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Messiah, the Holy One, the Anointed One. Then at the end of his life, his body is drenched with blood. He dies on the cross. But he was resurrected giving us the assurance that in the future, we will also enjoy a resurrected life for all of eternity. So these are the gospel readings for this Sunday. Gospel re the reading from John assures us that by believing in Jesus as our Lord and Savior and believing in his name, even though we have never seen him, we are truly blessed. Then the first reading from the book of Acts shows us how the first century church modeled the commandment to love one another by developing a community that truly cared and shared with those in need. And then the second reading from John's first letter tells us that the world will only be conquered by faith in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and putting into practice the commandment to love one another. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this lesson. We thank you that these things help reveal to us our relationship with you and our relationship to one another and our relationship to the world, how we need to perceive the world, how we need to understand the love that you have for all the world that we then need to share in. We thank you, Lord, that that love dwells within us, that on a day-to-day -day basis, we will be able to share that with others that we will overlook others' faults and that we will help them to come to you. We just thank you, Lord, you're going to give us that opportunity to share with others what you have done for us and that that testimony can help others understand that, that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior too and that by confessing him and asking forgiveness for their sins that they can be a member of Jesus family and a brother with Jesus be Jesus be their brother just as he is our brother so we thank you Lord receive these lessons and thanksgiving in Jesus name amen